Hello. Welcome to the Leicester St George's Festival. I, my name is Alan Kempthorne, but for the sake of keeping things nice and easy today, you can call me St George, because, well, you know. Of course, I wouldn't be St George if I didn't have a dragon. So this adorable little fella, here we go, hey yeah, yeah, this adorable little fella, stop that now, this is my friend Spot, and as you can see, he's only a little baby dragon. He's, uh, he's 300 years old, which is literally a baby in dragon years. Yeah, and... Uh, no, don't, don't worry about that one. That's that's just a picture on the wall, all right? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> now, listen. Every year in April, Leicester City Council brings you the Leicester St George's Festival, live from Orton Square in Old Leicester. Mm. Every year without fail. <clears throat> Except for last year, 2020, when, well, we failed. Mm. Yeah, but then fair enough, it was 2020 and nothing happened anywhere. Grim, wasn't it? So, this year, 2021, we thought, mm, still probably not wise to go cramming a thousand people together into Orton Square. So, we have gone one better. Oh yes, we have brought you the 2021 Leicester St George's Festival here in your computer screen online. Yeah. Oh, it's called technology. Yeah, no, I don't understand it either. So, every year in the St George's Festival, we've got all sorts of things going on. Lots of children's entertainment like juggling and magic and balloon modelling. Yeah, arts and crafts. The Leicester Library bus always comes along and there's storytelling. We've got stilt walkers. We got, uh, then we've got the Morris Man and the Maypole dancing, things like that. And we always like to end with a folk band. Yeah. So it's usually a lot of fun. Well, it's always a lot of fun. So this year, we've tried to keep the spirit of that exactly as intact as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. So we've got all of our regulars and some new people along to present to you the Leicester St George's Festival here on your computer screen for 2021. We hope we'll be back in Orton Square in 2022. But do you want a rundown of what we're going to be having? Yeah, lined up for today? All right, I'll give you that in just a minute, but first, shall we just have a quick look at a video of when we last got together for the Leicester St George's Festival in the hot April sunshine of 2019. <laughs> what it's all about. So we've done our best to recreate that sense of excitement for you here to enjoy in the comfort of your own home on your computer screen. Mm -hmm. So are you ready? Good. Let me transport you back into a time of myth and legend of castles and of dragons. So this is what we've got lined up for you today. In just a minute, I'll be giving you the story of St. George and the Dragon, just to fill you in on all the details in case you didn't know it. Then it's time for us to get crafting. Now, all the way throughout today, Giggle Town Arts are going to be here with lots of lovely arty and crafty medieval malarkey. <laughs> oh, I like that. 
So, you'll be needing all of your pens, your papers, uh, bits of cardboard, your scissors, your PVA glue, bits of cloth. Now, there's probably a link around here somewhere uh, to sh where you can download some of the things you need. Oh, you'll find the link. You're clever people. Then Sylvester the Jester will be here with his mandola. That's a medieval musical instrument. Yeah? Good. You knew that already, didn't you? Clever people! So today, Sylvester will be telling us all about the history of the Jester and sharing a Viking story from many centuries ago. Bill Brookman will be here bringing us his St George and the Dragon puppet mummers play. Giggletown Arts will then be back for more arts and crafts. Then it's time for a crazy magic show with magician Professor Strange from Britain's Got Talent. You know, it's amazing how much that guy looks like me. Hmm. Then Giggletown Arts and Crafts will be back again. And then we pop over to Leicester Libraries, where Matthew Vaughan will be reading the story Stone Soup. Sylvester the Jester then comes back for more. Then local historian Jim Butler will be here to take us on a guided virtual walk of Leicester's medieval city walls. By then, You'll probably be feeling hungry, won't you? Yeah, thought you would. So we've got Georgina from Historic Promotions who's going to be giving us a medieval cookery lesson. Yeah, personally, I can't wait for that one. And then we'll round off our virtual St George's Festival with some traditional folk music from the Leicester band Luma. Because, well, why wouldn't you? Now, I think I've got everything. If I've missed anything out, don't cut my head off. I'm only a knight. <laughs> now, before we launch ourselves headlong into this wild collection of medieval mayhem, I think we'd better remind ourselves of the old, old story of George and the Dragon. <laughs> Exactly. What's St George? And what's all this stuff about a dragon? And why do we even have a St George's Day at all? Well, like all good stories, this one starts a long, long time ago, in a land far, far away. And to be precise, it was 1,700 years ago, which is a pretty long time. And the place that we're talking about was this castle and it was called Silene. And down these mountains, if you follow them down into the bottom, there's a valley. And the valley is filled with a horrible swamp. Oh, and it's, it really is a nasty swamp. It smells horrible. It's, the stench is just awful. And there's insects flying around that buzz all the time and get caught in your hair. But there's a creature that lives down there that's even worse than any insect. Oh yeah, it's big, it's scary. It's dangerous and it's got great big fangs. Yep, it's a dragon. Now, dragons, as I'm sure you know, are very big, very scary monsters. And they breathe fire. And they've got wings, which means they can fly. Ooh, horrible. And do you know what they eat? <sighs> Pretty much anything they can find, to be honest. But they do like big animals, like sheep or goats. Or sometimes a person. And this dragon used to fly all over these mountains in these valleys, swooping down whenever it saw any animal or a person, breathing fire which would roast the poor animal alive. And then the dragon would gobble it all up. Oh, it was horrible. Now, of course, this really scared the people who lived in this castle. Well, you know, it would, wouldn't it, if you lived there and a great big dragon flying around all over the place? So, one day, they decided enough was enough. They could no longer live with this dragon terrorising the castle. So the king got together all of the wise people and all of his advisers and his counsellors and they had a really big meeting in that room there. So said the king. We need to find a way to kill or get rid of this dragon. It's just being a real nuisance. Yeah, that's right, said one of the advisors. Oh, we reckon we should kill it. Oh, no, no, we can't do that, your majesty, said the keeper of the guard. We're, we're a peaceful castle. We don't have enough trained fighters or knights to be able to get rid of that dragon. We can't kill it. Hmm, said somebody else. 
Can we stop the dragon coming to the castle at all? No, said the keeper of the guard again. There's no point in blocking the roads or trying to stop the dragon coming in, is there? You know, <laughs> it's got wings, it flies, it will just fly over everything we do. Just one minute though, said the queen. Maybe there is a way that we can stop the dragon coming to the castle. The dragon only comes to the castle when it's hungry. If we can stop it being hungry, then it will have no need to come and visit our castle. Oh yes, 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 said the king. That's a brilliant idea. <laughs> Every week on Tuesday afternoon, uh, round about tea time, we should send some sheep to the dragon. Yes, <laughs> then the dragon will eat the sheep and it won't come and visit us at all. <laughs> oh, what a marvellous plan. I'm so clever. So that's exactly what they decided to do. It was quite a clever plan. So, every Tuesday afternoon, round about tea time, the guards would select the two biggest, fattest sheep in the whole castle. And they would lead them down these stairs, to the valley and to the swamp. And then they would tie the two sheep up to a tree in a clearing near the swamp, right where they thought the dragon would find it. And then the guards would quickly run off again because they didn't want to be eaten by the dragon at all. And this plan worked very, very well because after the guards had gone back into the castle, they heard the horrible, horrible sounds of the dragon attacking the sheep. So, the dragon didn't go to the castle at all that week, so the people in the castle were delighted. So next Tuesday, they got two more sheep and they brought them down the stairs into the clearing in the swamp tied them to a tree, ran away, and once again, the dragon ate the sheep and didn't bother the castle. And they did this every week. Tuesday, about tea time. Week after week after week, two more sheep, two more sheep, two more sheep. Until a few months later, they hit a bit of a problem. The castle had run out of sheep. So the king and the queen once again had another meeting in this room here, and they got all of their advisors and wise people together again. <laughs> this is terrible, said the king. Oh, we've stopped the dragon from coming here for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks, but now we've run out of sheep. What are we to do? The advisors all scratched their heads again. Again, they had no answer. But then one of the guards, very slowly, and very gingerly put up his hand and said, Well, your majesty, if I might say something here, but... <clears throat> well, spit it out, man, said the king. What are you trying to say? Well, your majesty, uh, oh, you're not gonna like this. Tell us, tell us. <sighs> well, your majesty, <clears throat> we've run out of sheep. We've got to give the dragon something to eat. I reckon the only thing left for us to do is instead of bringing it a sheep, bring it a person to eat. Well, there was an uproar and nobody liked this idea at all. But the more they thought about it, the more they realized that there was really nothing else they could do. If they were to take a person every Tuesday around about tea time and tie that person to the tree in the swamp and let the dragon eat that one person, it would mean the dragon would no longer come and terrorise the castle and kill many, many more. <sighs> okay, said the king. Well, it's Tuesday tomorrow, so um, we'd better choose someone who's going to uh, go and be eaten by the dragon. Everybody looked at each other very nervously. So, um, said the king, any volunteers? Everybody just continued um, looking around, just dumb. Um, <laughs> trying to pretend that they weren't really there. No one wanted to be chosen as the person who is going to be eaten by the dragon. Oh, 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 said an excitable minister. I've got a plan as well. Oh, here, this is what we're going to do, right? We're going to write down the names of everybody in the castle on a bit of paper. Yeah, and we'll put it in an urn, shake it up a bit. And then that way we can just reach in and choose who's going to be chosen every single Tuesday. Yeah. Good plan, good plan, good plan. You like it, right? 
And actually it was the best plan that they had. They were a bit short of options after all. So they decided that they would do that. They would write down the name of every single person in the castle. Young or old? Sick or healthy? Male or female? From the poorest servant all the way up to the king and the queen and, the, and their daughter the princess so that everyone in the castle had the same equal chance of being chosen. So later that afternoon they had written down the names of everybody in the castle and they'd put them into a great big urn. The king got his ceremonial sword. He wasn't really much good with a real sword and he stirred the pieces of paper in the urn and he reached in and he chose at random one piece of paper. He pulled out the piece of paper. He unfolded it. He looked at the name. He went pale. He sat down. Oh, what's the matter, your majesty? Who is it? Who's on the bit of paper? Asked everybody. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, said the king in an obvious fluster. And he showed them the piece of paper. And on the piece of paper was written the name of the king's daughter, the princess Sabra. <gasps> Not my daughter, my darling daughter, squealed the king. But what could they do? They had all decided that to be fair, they had to put on the names of everybody in the castle into that urn. Unfortunately, it had to be her. So the king and queen and their guards went all the way up to the highest tower in the castle, which was where the princess was. And the king and the queen fell at the feet of the princess and sobbed and told her what had happened, that she had been randomly selected to be the one person who was going to be fed to that dragon the following day. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. This was a horrible, horrible situation to be in. But the princess was resigned to her duty. I'm ready. Take me to meet my fate. So all of the guards escorted the princess down these steps, all the way down to the clearing in the swamp, where they tied her to the tree. And then they ran off and left her to be eaten by the dragon. cried the princess. Oh, what is to become of me? I'm too young to die. I don't want to be eaten by a great big dragon, but it's what I gotta do. A long way away at the other side of the swamp, a Roman knight called George mm -hmm, rode along on his big white horse. And as he listened to the sounds of all the insects buzzing, he thought he heard something else. He listened very carefully. Gosh, right, yes, definitely. That is the sound of someone crying. <gasps> right, someone is in trouble, said the knight. Ha <laughs> ha, knight to the rescue. And off he rode to find out why someone was crying in the swamp. Ha <laughs> ha, ah, 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 oh, this swamp's a long way. Ah. <sighs> oh, it's all right, I'm here now. <laughs> when George arrived in the clearing, he saw the Princess Sabra tied to a tree at the edge of the swamp. <gasps> My lady, he said with amazement, why is such a beautiful princess tied to a tree in this horrible, smelly swamp? What on earth is going on? But just as the princess was about to speak, there was a loud roar from the swamp behind George. He looked. <gasps> it was the dragon. <gasps> well, George was a trained fighter. He fought in many, many armies and he knew how to use a sword. Oh, yes, he did. So he leapt off his horse and he came at the dragon with a mighty blow. Whoosh! And the sword went right through the dragon's shoulder, just about there. And the dragon fell down with a mighty roar and landed with a splash in the swamp. Whew. 
George used his sword to uncut the Princess Sabra from the tree and loosen her ropes. But as he was doing that, the dragon behind him slowly climbed to his feet again because the dragon wasn't dead. He was only injured. <gasps> and now the dragon was really, really angry. The dragon came at George with a mighty roar. George reached up and got his sword again and he stabbed at the dragon and he attacked the dragon and the dragon got him and he got the dragon and there was claws and sword and claws and sword and oh, it was a terrible, terrible fight. But finally, with one final lunge of his sword, George managed to kill the dragon and the dragon fell down. Ah! Completely dead. Ooh, my hero, said the princess. And George picked up the delicate princess and put her on the horse behind him. And the two of them rode together all the way to the castle. And as they arrived in the courtyard of the castle, all the people of the castle saw George and they saw the princess and they, they came running to see what had happened. <gasps> Hooray! Hooray! They said when they found out that George had killed the dragon. Oh, thank you, brave knight, said the king. One is very, very grateful, said the queen. Yes, yes, and for saving the princess, my daughter, who I love very dearly, and killing the dragon, and saving everybody else who lives in the castle, I will give you great rewards, and I, you can marry my daughter. Ha ha ha! Oh yes, I'd rather like that, said the princess. All right, said George. And he got married to the princess and they lived a long and happy life in the castle together until George died a happy old man uh, many, many years later in the year 303 on April the 23rd. And so that is the story of St. George and the dragon. Now, as I say, this story is a very, very old story. It's 1,700 years old. So this story has been told, told, and retold, and retold many, many thousands of times. And the thing about really old stories like that, when they've been told so many times, is no one really is sure anymore whether the story is true or not. Was there really a knight called George all those many, many, many centuries ago? Well, Historians and experts think that there was, yeah. But was there actually a dragon in this story 1,700 years ago? Well, historians and experts think that there probably wasn't a dragon. They're not sure that dragons existed. So maybe in this story, George, originally he fought something else. And as people told the story many, many, many times, people started to say it was a dragon. But we are pretty certain there was a knight called George who did save the castle. So this still leaves the question, why is St. George the patron saint of England? And why do we have a St. George's Day? Well, that's another story. I'm not going to go into it great length because we've got other things to move on to. But that's down to an English king called King Edward III who lived in medieval times. He probably lived in a castle like this as well. Because King Edward III had heard this old, old story about St. George from a thousand years before, he thought that would be a good story to tell all of his knights, so that when they went into battle, they too could feel brave, like St. George. Because after all, the story about St. George is one man who fought a mighty dragon that everyone else thought was unkillable. This one brave man had triumphed over adversity. And King Edward III thought that was a good thing to tell his soldiers before they went into war. So the soldiers liked the story of, uh, of St. George and the dragon, and they won the war. So from that point on, King Edward III decided he would make St. George the patron saint of England. And he would celebrate it every year on April the 23rd, which was the day that St. George, a thousand years earlier, had died. watching the Leicester St George's Festival, which this year is happening here online. Now, I hope you've got your scissors, your colouring pens and all your craft things like I told you to. What? 
Oh, you haven't? Oh, come on, I told you to. Look, we're sword making and puppet making with Giggle Town Arts today, so... All right, look, I'm going to give you a few seconds to run off and get all your craft things, right? Scissors, paints, bits of cloth and stuff like that, okay? Off you go, off you go, go on, hurry, hurry! <sighs> oh, for those of you who are just still waiting for all the slow people, uh, let me just give you a rundown of some of the things that we've still got going on today here at the uh, St. George's Festival. So we've got music, we've got magic, we've got medieval history, we've got hmm, medieval cooking. Oh yeah, you heard me right. Uh, and we've got more arts and crafts, fun, frivolity, festivities. We've packed it all in for you here on one screen. This is where it's at, people. <laughs> all right. OK, so is everyone back with your craft things? Good. You got your scissors? Good. All right. Here's Giggle Town Arts. Hi, I'm Matt, and I'll be making puppets and wands and jester sticks for Leicester's St George's Day Festival. You can download the activity sheets at Visit Leicester. And now we're going to make tube puppets. So for the tube puppets, you need to download the uh, worksheets. So there's the activity sheet there. We have St George, we have a princess, we have a dragon, and we have a jester. So once you've downloaded the sheet, you need to cut out all the pieces so do this very carefully. So first I'm going to cut out the body, which is a big rectangle. So there's the first piece. Now, when you've cut out all the pieces, you should have a selection of pieces like this. So that's the main body. Then we have the head. And we have the feet, the arms, a helmet and a sword. So these are called tube puppets. And that's because when you stick them together, you roll them round into a tube. So get your glue stick, put plenty of glue on the tab. The tab is marked A, so you put plenty of glue onto the tab. Then gently roll the body till the two ends meet and then should have a nice tube. So that's the body. So now we need to put on the head. So that's St George's head. Gently bend it so it fits to the card. Again, put lots of glue on, or you can use sellotape or double-sided tape. Then glue the head on to the center. So there we have St George with a body and a head. Then I think we'll glue on the feet. So these are the feet. Just gently fold the top like so. Then put glue on the inside. So again, plenty of glue. And you're putting it on the inside because you want to fold it under at the front so we can see his feet. So press that nice and hard. And then we have one flat foot there. Then do the same again. Put the glue on the inside, on the printed side. Lots of glue on. There. And then press that nice and hard. There's his feet. So then you want to put his arms on. So gently bend the arms slightly so they come out. We don't want it all being flat. We want the puppet to have some expression. So put a dab of glue at the top. And you'll need to check whether it is his right arm or his left arm. And then put it on the right side. 
let's just fold that slightly. And then the other arm. Plenty of glue. And then place that on the other side. And then just give it a little fold. So there's St. George. So with the helmet, you can have some tabs on the side so that the helmet can be placed on. Like so, or you can take it off. And then you've got a sword, so let's put some glue on there and I'm going to glue the sword on. It's optional if you want to glue the sword on or... There, let's pop that in his hand. Press it nice and tight. So there we have the finished St George. Now let's put him with the others. So we have... St. George, pop him there. We have the dragon, we have the jester, and we have the princess. So now we're going to make some jester sticks and wands. Now these are a nice easy make. So you need to download the activity sheet. Now on the activity sheet, there's lots of different uh, shapes. There's butterflies, hearts, there's some faces, there's a jester, there's a dragon. So download that and then cut out the shape that you like. So to make your jester stick or a magic wand, you need to select a rod. So you need to find a stick so find a nice looking stick, this one looks quite nice, or you might want a plain stick, or you might want to go for a tube. So for a tube you can make a nice jester stick, or with the stick you might want to put a butterfly on top and then put some streamers. So you can use ribbon or you can use paper that you've cut into strips. So first select your stick, so let's use this one. Cut out your shape, so I'm going to put a jester on top, so I've cut out a jester. Then uh, get some glue, put lots of glue on and then stick it to the top of your stick. And then on the back, to hold it into, in place, pop another shape. So I'm going to put a star. So again, lots of glue on the back. There. And then glue that on the back. So you've got a double-sided topper. So there we have a very simple jester stick. Or you might like to put some ribbons on or some streamers. So see what you've got around the house. You might have some things from old gift wrap or old decorations. And then put it near the top of the stick and tie it into a knot. Nice and tight. like so. If the streamers are too long, like this one, you might just want to snip the end. So get your scissors and just snip. So there's one wand. You can use any stick or any tube that you want. So with a plain cardboard tube like this, Use some sticky tape at the ends. Find the end. 
Then get some ribbon. So I'm going to use some blue ribbon and some green ribbon. So place the ribbon at the top and then quite tightly wind it round and round so you get a stripe going all the way down. And when you get to the bottom, fix it in place and then cut off the excess. Then go back to the top with the green. So there's the green ribbon. We're going to stick that onto the top and wrap it round nice and tight. So we get a nice two-tone effect going all the way down. And when you've done that, fix it at the bottom and you should end up with a nice decorated stick like this. So that's my jester stick. And there's my magic wand. Hey, thank you Giggle Town Arts. And they'll be back a little bit later on in the day too with some more arty crafty wonderfulness. So keep all your craft things handy, all right? Uh, and also hold on to that little medieval puppet. You'll be wanting that soon when we join Mr. Bill Brookman for his puppet version of the traditional St. George and the Dragon Mama's play. But first, right here, right now, this is Sylvester the Jester. Right, hello everybody. Uh, I'm Sylvester the Jester, official jester to the city of Leicester, dressed in polyester. Well, it's linen actually, but that don't rhyme with the other stuff. A happy St. George's Day to you. I am a player of tunes, a singer of songs, and a teller of extremely bad jokes. <laughs> Would you like to hear an extremely bad joke? Yeah. Well, I know lots of those. Why have giraffes got long necks? Because they got smelly feet. And what is orange and sounds like a parrot? A carrot. And what goes? <laughs> Splash. A man laughing his head off in the bath. Now, my jokes get worse and worse and worse as the day goes on. So I think that's enough jokes for the time being. I'm going to tell you a little bit about jesters. Now, a long time ago, in medieval times, um, you would find jesters in uh, castles, in palaces, in big houses, um, and they would entertain kings and queens and princes and princesses and dukes and duchesses and anybody rich and posh, really. And um, the idea was to try and cheer everybody up, keep everybody happy. And uh, so one thing the jesters particularly did was to tell jokes and um, do stupid things. They, they, they pull faces and they do things like going out into the garden and uh, with a pair of scissors and trying to cut the lawn. And uh, well, another thing that some of them did was storytelling. So I'm going to tell you a little story now. Now... A long, 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 long time ago, there was a little village by the seaside. And the people who lived in a little village by the seaside were very, very happy until one day they heard a wild, wicked rumour that the Vikings might be coming. They were a bit worried about this because the Vikings were big and they liked fighting with everybody. Well, the people in the village were only little. They didn't like fighting at all. So they all got together, sat round a campfire and decided what to do and they made a plan. Then they got a little man to sit on a rock by the sea and every day he would look out to sea to see what he could see. And most days all he could see was the sea and a few seagulls. But one day he looked out to sea and there in the distance were lots of boats with big ugly heads on the front of them like dragon's heads and monster's heads. And he thought to himself, aha, I know who that is. So he put his horn to his mouth and he blew. <coughs> and he shouted out, the Vikings are coming, the Vikings are coming. Now the people in the village heard that. They knew exactly what to do because they made a plan. Meanwhile, the Vikings landed their boats on the beach. They started running up the beach, but the people of the village they knew exactly what to do. They, they knew that the Vikings had very sensitive ears. 
they didn't like lots of noise, really made their ears hurt. And one thing that they didn't really, really didn't like was the children whistling. So the people of the village got all the children of the, of the village together and as the Vikings approached the village, they got the children all to whistle really, really loud. So you can help us out if you will. Give us a little whistle. Oh, the Vikings didn't like that. They stopped in their tracks, they turned around, they put their hands over their ears, they ran as fast as they could down to their boats. Now, they'd had a, the odd bottle of wine the night before, so their boats were full of bottles and corks. So they picked a couple of corks up and they stuffed them in their ears and they thought, that'll do the trick. We won't be able to hear anything this time. And they went running back up the beach towards the village. This time, the people of the village had another plan. They knew there was one thing the Vikings liked. Worse than whistling children, that was laughing children. So this time, I want you to all help, help us out by laughing a little bit. They got all the children of the village to laugh their heads off. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, the Vikings didn't like that. They put their hands over their ears, they turned around, they ran down the beach fast as they could. Now this time they took the corks out of their ears and all around their boats was lots of slimy seaweed. Well, they picked the slimy seaweed up and they slopped it in their ears like that. Yeah. And then they went running back up the beach towards the village. But this time, the people of the village had another plan. They knew there was one thing the Vikings liked. Worse than whistling children, worse than laughing children, and that was screaming children. So this time, they got all of the children of the village to scream as loud as they could. <coughs> The Vikings absolutely hated that. They put their hands over their ears, they turned around, they ran down the beach fast as they could, they jumped in their boats, they rowed away and were never seen again. Thank you very much for helping me frighten the Vikings away. Well, that's about it for me for a little while, but I'll be back later. Don't run away. Bye-bye. I really enjoyed that and I hope that you're enjoying yourselves too. I'm St George. See, St George's cross and everything. Yeah, see, no messing about. This is the Leicester St George's Day Festival here live on your computer screen. Yes! Now, can I ask you a question? Have you got that little puppet that you made earlier with Giggle Town Arts? Hmm. Have you thought of a name for it yet? Oh, come on, come on, a puppet needs a name. Anyway, get your puppet, put it right here in front of your screen so we can enjoy this next traditional St. George's Day entertainment in puppet form. Because right now, my friends, it is time for Bill Brookman's St. George and the Dragon Puppet Mama's Play. Ladies and gentlemen, children all, I am the prologue. I tell it all. A tale of excitement, of danger and fear. Our St George got quite worried when the dragon did appear. And see how the princess is tied to a tree and left for the dragon whose dinner it'll be. But all will come right, sure as night follows day. With St George, the dragon and the princess in our own Mama's play. Ah! Help me, help me, brave St. George. The dragon plans on me to gorge. And if you see him off for me, I'll give you cakes and jam and tea. In come I, brave St. George. My friends all call me Georgie Porge. I used to kiss the girls and make them cry. But now I just kill the dragon and then he'll die. Hello, dragon, where are you? In days of old, when knights were bold, a knight to fight might risk it. For a favour from a pretty maid, say a kiss, or a glove, or a biscuit. 
Has anyone got a biscuit? Get on with it, you dinosaur! I'm the maiden you're rescuing! Ooh, uh. Now to find the dragon. Where is he? He's behind you! Right, I'll have a look. Not there. Where is he? He's behind you! Right, I'll have another look. Not there either. Where is he? He's behind you! Oh, no, he isn't. Oh, yes, he is! Oh, no, he isn't. Oh, yes, he is! Oh, no, he... Ugh! Oh, my gosh, he's really big. I thought I wouldn't care a fig. I'll get him with slishes. I'll get him with slashes. I'll get him with bishes. I'll get him with bashes. Have at you now, here I come. I'll make you call out for your mum. I won't get tired, you naughty dragon. There is no chance you'll catch me flagging. All day long St George and the dragon did fight His slasher slashed, the dragon's gnashes did bite But St George had exhausted his mane and might But the dragon said stop because it was night Two cups of cocoa and a sleepy beep And off to bed without a peep It was next morning after breakfast when They carried on knocking seven bells out of each other again the fight went on next day until three. But the princess got bored and escaped from the tree and said, Sisters, we're doing it for ourselves, see? St George was heard to mutter, I thought the two days of fighting were me. But before the princess could deal the final blow, A little baby dragon joined in with the show and said, Mummy, come home. Don't eat princess. She's meat. I found some at Modern. Vegan. It's quite a tweet. The moral. So with manipulated plot and contrived twists of fate, Appenar play won't get cancelled, it's read up to date. St George he lives again, he's just woken his ways. Well, nostalgia ain't what it used to be, like in good old days. Thank you! <laughs> And thank you, but... Oh, <laughs> there you are. I was uh, facing the wrong way. That's embarrassing. Thank you, Bill Brookman. Uh, he was on Britain's Got Talent, you know. And so was one of our other guests, still yet to come, Professor Strange with his magic show. Ooh. So let me just give you a quick rundown of what you've still got yet to come here at the Leicester St George's Festival, which this year is on your screen. So... In a little while, we've got, hmm, as I say, Professor Strange with the Magic Show. Then there'll be more from Giggletown Arts. And then Matthew Vaughan from Leicester Libraries will be here reading Stone Soup. Then we'll meet up again with Sylvester the Jester. Uh, how about a guided virtual walk along the, the old walls of Leicester with local historian Jim Butler? Mm -hmm. Oh, do you know what's coming then? Yeah. Medieval Cookery Demonstration with Georgina from Historic Promotions. Oh, I feel hungry just thinking about that one. And then we'll end with some lively music from the local folk and roots band, Luma. So, does that sound like a good plan? Yeah, I thought so too. So before all of that, shall we do some more arty crafty thingy wingy? Yeah? All right, here's Giggle Town Arts. <laughs> Hi, I'm Matt, and I'm here for St George's Day Festival. Today we're going to be making crowns like these, and these nice shiny ones. 
To make a crown, you need to download the worksheet for the crowns. There's two templates. So you need to cut out the templates. And once you've cut out the templates, you need to make three of the template that you've made. So you need to cut out three pointy crowns, if that's the one you choose. Or if you want the one with the crosses on top, you need to cut out three lengths of the cross crown. So once you've cut out your parts, you should have a section like this. Nice long section that will go all the way around your head. So this is the crown. Now the card you can use to make the crown, any card that you find around the house, we've got gift wrap, old paper bags, cardboard from food, again more bags. So you make three lengths, take them together, fit it so it will fit your head, and then you have your crown. Now once you have your crown, there's different options. You can either paint it a nice bright colour, check with your parents uh, before you start using the paint, or you can cover it with tin foil or gift wrap. So if you're going to cover it with tin foil or gift wrap, what you want to do is get your glue sticks and put plenty of glue all over, all over the crown, right to the edges, all the way along. Now each layer you'll put on will make your crown stronger. And then once you've got the glue all the way along, you get your tin foil. Place it on top and then gently smooth it so it sticks to the glue and you should see an impression underneath where the outline of the crown is coming through. Allow it a few minutes to dry. Don't worry if you get creases in it, just rub those in, it'll make the crown look a bit older. So once you've done that, you should end up with a crown that looks like this. So just to check, put it around your head, hold it at the right length, and then fix it using sticky tape or glue. And then you have your crown. So once you have your crown, you want to add some decoration. So you need to print off the next sheet We've got sample shapes. So cut these out. We've got a selection here. We've got flowers, Ooh. more crosses, diamonds, little hearts, little shields. Now to make a nice effective decoration, one, thing, uh, one way to do it is to build up uh, levels and build up layers. So cut out a few shapes. So I'm going to use the flowers here. Have one for the bottom flower. Take another flower and fold it in half. Use your glue stick again. Just put some glue down the middle and then pop it on your flower so you get a slight 3D effect. Then take another flower, fold it in half, put on some more glue, pop that in, and then if you pull out the petals, you get a nice 3D effect flower. Again, use glue or sticky tape and place these around your crown. Just fluff them out slightly, that's it. So you could do a mixture of flowers, butterflies, badges, shields and diamonds. And there's some other activity sheets as well, which we'll show you when we get to the shields. Okay, so now we're going to make a shield. You need to download the sheet. Now on the sheet, again, it has two templates to make a small shield or a template to make a larger shield.
So for the small shield first, cut out the template, like so. Get some card. Again, you can use any card. This is a well-known brand of cereal. So pop that onto your card, draw around. So you want to cut that out carefully. And then when you've cut that out, you should have something that looks like this. Now the same with the crowns, when we covered it with tin foil, you need to put glue all over, all over your shield and then carefully smooth on the tin foil. Then once you've got that, gently, gently bend it. Now on the template sheet, right at the bottom, right down here, you'll notice that there's a green band and that is to make the handle that goes on the back of the shield. So cut that out and then you'll have something like this. Cover it or paint it. Then you want to stick it onto the back of your shield, like so. So use something nice and strong like double-sided tape or sellotape will do. Pop that on and then press firmly and it should stay in place. Then do the other side. Use your glue or your sticky tape. Pop it on. Press firmly and then it should stay in shape. So that's the basis of your shield. I'll show you how to decorate it. First, I want to show you how to make the bigger shield. So for the bigger shield, you're cutting out template B. You need to get a piece of card, fold it in half, then get your template, pop it on, draw around your template, all the way around. doesn't have to be really neat. So you put your template up to the folded part of the card. Like so. Then when you cut out, you'll have one big, one big shield. So let's cut that out. Then, when you open it up, let's hope you have a complete shield. So once you have your complete shield, you can paint it, or, like the other shield, you can cover it with tin foil. Again, put lots of glue all over, like so. All around the edge. And then don't forget to put some in the middle as well. And nearly done. Then you get your tin foil or your gift wrap. Let's use, let's use this gift wrap. We'll pop that on there. Place it on, smooth it on. So. And then just cut around the edge and then you'll have the basis of your shield. And then you have, well, I have a nice gold shield. So you need to put your handle on the back. Again, cut out the green template on the bottom. A 
and then using sticky tape, stick it onto the back. And press down hard. Slightly bend the handle so you can get your hand in. And tape the other side. That's it. So press both sides down so it stays on nice and tight. And there you have your shield. So now we need to decorate the shield. So to decorate the shield, we have the sample shapes. You can also cut out your own shapes, or you can cut out shapes from magazines or your favourite uh, comics. So I'm going to pick some mini shields this time. So you can place them around. So. And if you want to, you can also build these up by doing layers, like we did with the flowers. So put some glue on, and then pop it into the middle, and then glue it in place. Now, as we're using tin foil, you'll probably have lots of offcuts. So what you can use little discs of card, cover those with glue and then get your offcuts of tin foil, scrunch it up slightly and then you can make little medallions or little coins and stick those on, press them down nice and hard so it gets a nice texture there. Then get Let's put a couple of these on. So put the sticky tape on. Press it down nice and firm. You don't want them falling off. If you want them to come out more, then you can use bottle tops and lids. And again, you can use foil so you get your foil, wrap the bottle top, just scrunch it in, it should stay. That's the good thing about foil, it stays in place. So let's do three of these. Foil. Scrunch it all round. And one final one. And then using your sticky tape or your glue, you want to glue them in place. So let's see, where can these go? I have one there, one there. And what other shapes? Ah some diamonds so we'll put some diamonds around the edge so get your glue a bit more glue uh, and then a heart we'll put a heart on the other side So once you've stuck everything in place, you'll end up with a shield. Now with the smaller one, you can hold it in one hand. So you can have one shield in that hand and another shield in that hand. Or if you're really clever, you could have a go at making a cardboard sword. Thank you, Giggle Town Arts. And they'll be back again a little bit later on. Now, let's just have a look at the time, shall we? Ah, I thought so. Yeah, it is time for a magic show. Are you in the mood for a bit of magic? Good, I was hoping you'd say that, because I would like to reveal to you my secret identity. Yeah, 
I'm not St. George all the time, you know. Ha 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 No, 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 no. Because, my friends, as some of you already know, when I'm not a mild-mannered, dragon-slaying, third-century Roman soldier called St. George, I like to put on this hat. And I become the one, the only, the magical... Professor Strange! Greetings and welcome to my world of strange magic. My name is Professor Strange. You may recognise me from the television show Britain's Got Talent, or it may be that you have seen me perform at one of the theme parks or holiday parks or tourist attractions around this fine island nation of ours. But today, my friends, here, it is the Leicester St George's Festival. And I will be performing for you marvels, miracles, and magical wonders that you have never seen before. And, to be honest, will never see again. So, let's start with this. In today's magic show, we are going to achieve the impossible, the spectacular, and the astounding. But for this, a strange magician such as myself needs a strange magic tool. And I use this. A magic wand. Now I'm sure an intelligent person such as yourself has seen magic wands before. But allow me to explain how mine is different in an important yet subtle way. You see my friends, most magic wands are black with white ends. This clearly is not. This clearly is white with a long black middle. It's true. <laughs> now I have a magic wand. You're going to need a magic wand too, but don't you worry my friends with a magic blow. We have one for you. <laughs> now, let me just see because I think you and I are not alone today. We are joined by other people watching as well. We're going to need a magic wand for them as well. Hmm. Do you think three will be enough? I'm not so sure, so... Four magic wands! No, hold on just one moment! There are more than four of us today, so we are going to need five magic wands. Ah, hold on. One, two, three, four, five... Ah, six magic wands! Do you think six is enough? I'm not too sure. Let's have seven magic wands. In fact, let's have eight magic wands. Let's have nine magic wands. Let's have ten magic wands. Eleven magic wands. Twelve magic wands. Thirteen magic wands. Fourteen magic wands. Fifteen magic... Oh, my goodness me. I think there are enough magic wands there for all of us. <laughs> you've got one, you've got one, you've got one, you've got one, you've got one. And I, of course, have my own special... <laughs> really big one. Hmm. Now, my friends, in my search for the strange, my quest for the quizzical, my exploration of the inexplicable, I have come across this strange situation. If we were to take, for instance, a handful of cards, uh, let's have a look. We have one, two, three, four, five cards. Just to be absolutely clear, we shall count them backwards. Five, four, three, two, one cards. And just to be doubly clear, we will also count them in French. Un, deux, trois, quatre, cinq. Hmm. Just to be really clever, we shall also count them in Welsh. Ian, die, très, padua, pump. Ha ha. To be super, super clever, we shall also count them in Japanese. Ish, ni, san. Oh dear. I'm afraid my Japanese is a little bit rusty and I'm not quite sure how to count to five in Japanese. Eto ne honto nihongo o wakaranai. So, what we will do, my friends, is we will get rid of one, two of these cards. Ha ha! Therefore, we now only have the three. One, two, three, four, five. Oh, that is confusing. One, two, three, four, five. For I thought, as indeed you thought, that we had five cards, and we threw away one, two of the cards. Therefore, leaving us with only one, two, three, four, five cards. Hmm. Let's double check, because this is a confusing situation. One, two, three, four, five cards. 
Okay, there we are. So we will throw away one, two cards. Leaving us, of course, with only one, two, three, four, five cards. Hmm. I know. Let's try things a little differently, shall we? Let's, instead of throwing away two cards, we will throw away one, two, three, <laughs> four, five cards. Therefore, leaving us, of course, with only one, two, three, four, five cards. Well, I think this what this clearly shows us is there really needs to be five cards. So if that's what they want, we'll keep it that way. My dearest friends, we live indeed in a magical world and all around us is magic in its purest form. This is how I do my feats of the impossible. I have to train my mind to find the magic all around us. For instance, there is magic uh, here in its purest form. Now, when you're holding and dealing with magic, you have to exercise caution, for magic is indeed a dangerous beast. In fact, it's also very hot to hold, so I'm not sure I can hold this for much, much longer. So, in fact, that, that really is beginning to burn me. Um, <coughs> excuse my conumbrance, uh, it's really beginning to heat up, and I, uh, oh dear, um, I need to do something with this quickly. Um, <coughs> That's a little bit, oh, 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 a little bit hot on the tongue there, I fear. Um, uh, oh, no, um, oh, that's, ah, oh, <laughs> crikey, oh, oh, gosh, oh, 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 dear, oh, my goodness, that does wake the spirit. I hold in my hand a curious device, its purpose for which I am about to explain. But first, it has come to my attention that at this point in the proceedings, some of you fine people may have acquired something of a thirst. Are you indeed in need of refreshment? Do you wish to imbibe? Would you like a drink? Good. I was hoping you would say that, for that is where this humble device comes in. This curious curiosity will create for you a drink of your choosing. So, to operate this, we require a magic wand, like this. And we require you to think of the name of a drink. Better yet, for you to say the name of your drink out loud, which I would ask you to do on the count of three. One, two, three! Aha! Wonderful choice, if I might say so. So now we just need to wake up the spirits within. <laughs> Hello? Are you awake? <laughs> and if the magic has indeed worked, there will be, in here, the drink of your choice. For we have got... <laughs> Grape juice! No? No, are you sure? You didn't ask for a grape juice. You really didn't ask for a grape juice. Okay, well that's fine, fair enough. Let's try again. Hello, not a grape juice. We have got, in here, ha ha ha! It's an orange juice. No, you weren't after an orange juice. Are you absolutely sure? All right then, not an orange juice. That's told it. We have got in here for you. We have got <laughs> pineapple juice. No, you didn't want a pineapple juice either. Are you absolutely sure? My my. If you insist. Okay then. Not a not a pineapple juice. <laughs> we have not a pineapple juice. Mango juice. You you don't want a mango juice either. My goodness me, you are being awkward. If I may say so, we're running out of choices. May we go for something a little bit more <laughs> along the lines of a milkshake. Who would like a milkshake? You're not after a milkshake either. My word, my word. Are you absolutely sure? Well, okay, if you insist, not a milkshake. There, that's told it. <laughs> not a milkshake we've got for you, Coca-Cola. 
not a Coca-Cola either. My, my goodness me, people, my goodness me. You're making this really, really hard work for me. I thought, I thought many of you would like a Coke. No? All right. Think again, what would you like to drink? All right. Are you sure that you wouldn't like your original choice? Which was, ha ha, the grape juice. You are certain about the grape juice. Well, that's fair enough. We will get rid of the grape juice. Ah, perhaps like me, your tastes go in the direction. Have a glass of this. Now you join me today in the auspicious surroundings of my secret magic garden. And this is where I grow all of my magic flowers, my magic plants, and my magic vegetables. That's right, my friends. Vegetables can be magic. Allow me to elaborate, for if you look very carefully just here, this is where I grow uh, my magic carrots. Yes, ha <laughs> ha! Now you may be thinking that the humble carrot is far from magic. Well, let me tell you, magic this is, and humble this is not. For with the right magic carrot, all I need to do is just give it a blow, and it becomes two carrots. <laughs> it's true, if I plant that one down there, I still have one here, and with a blow, it becomes another carrot. And I can put that one down there as well, and I can just give it another blow, and we have another carrot. And no matter how many times I plant that one, blow on this one, we just keep getting another carrot, and another carrot, and another carrot, and my friends, another carrot, <laughs> and another carrot. In fact, how many times? Another carrot. In fact, there might be another carrot. That there's no limit to hold on another carrot. Right. <laughs> now, no matter how many times I make another carrot, I will always still have the original carrot and the other carrot. <laughs> In fact, if I was to throw away the, the other carrot, and if I was to throw away the original carrot, I would still have another carrot that wasn't the original carrot, but could also make another carrot. And then I can have two carrots that I can put away, and I can still manage to pluck from here another carrot. And that is what I love about my secret magic garden <laughs> and my secret magic vegetables. Now, my friends, something I've noticed in our brief time together today, you have a very keen mind. And something you might have noticed about me, I too have a very keen mind. So let's see if we can lock our keen minds together in a feat of psychic transmission. To help us with this noble exercise today, I will be using this. A packet of crayons. Now, if you look at the colors, in the crayons. We've got green, we've got blue, we've got red, we've got all the main colours there. I would like you to think of one of those colours. There we go. Think of a colour. In fact, my friends, speak it loud. For I, with the power of my mind, am going to make your colour disappear from this packet of crayons. Here we go. Do you have a colour? Speak it aloud once more. Wonderful. Your colour will disappear on the count of three. One, two, three. Oh my, your colour has indeed disappeared. <laughs> but I have to point out, every colour has disappeared. Well, there's one simple reason for that. You and me are not alone today. We are being watched today by thousands of people. Oh my. <laughs> and you've all thought of a different Colour. Which renders the exercise a little pointless. So I think we'd just better get your colour back in to the packet. If you forgive me for saying, I'm enjoying your company with me today so much that I would love to do the honour of capturing your likeness upon my easel. <laughs> May I draw your portrait? Oh, you are very kind, for that way I can hang it onto my wall and I can think of you forevermore. Now, the only issue that I have, though, is that you are not alone in watching me today. 
In fact, there are hundreds, ne'er say I say, thousands of you watching me at this particular moment. <laughs> Am I? So for me to draw your portrait would mean I have to draw your portrait. And by that, I mean the portrait of all the many thousands of people who are watching me. So this picture may be somewhat generic, but I shall try and capture the likeness of as many of you as possible. So I think, my friends, for me to do this, I would need to start the obvious way, with a pair of eyes. For I know that most of you do indeed have two eyes. In fact, you also have eyebrows. Thus, we need to do the little pupils in the middle. <laughs> like this. We also need some eyelids for, dare I say it, you are looking just a little bit tired today. Oh, do you have a nose? I thought as much. Could you put your finger on your nose? No, on it, not in it. That's, that's really quite disgusting. There we go. Now, I believe it's law in a portrait for you to smile. May I see your biggest smile? <laughs> beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. There we are. Ha ha! All your features nicely in place. The only thing left now is the head to keep them all nice and safe in. Does that look like you? <gasps> oh my, ha! <laughs> you need hair. Now, this is where it gets a little bit awkward because everybody watching has got a different style hair. Some of you have hair like that. Some of you have hair like that. Some of you have hair like that. And some of you have no hair at all. Which is why this picture has all known hairstyles. <laughs> now, be honest with me. Is this lifelike? Oh. What? Not at all? Not one bit? Hmm. Now, I do see your point, but for us to make this a little bit more lifelike, we may have to use magic. So I need to utilize a magic tool that you will no doubt know about, but perhaps were not aware that it is magic. And that magic tool is this magic marker. Hence the name. And all we have to do is just wave the magic marker side to side, side to side, and maybe the picture will start coming to life. Now I know what you're thinking. You're, you may be thinking there is something special about this magic marker that is causing the eyes to move. So if I hold the magic marker thus, the eyes can still move. And for us to be really sure that this picture has indeed come to life. All we need to do is ask it. I say, picture, have you come to life? Yes! And I think our answer is done. Yes! <laughs> yes! You can stop saying yes now. No! You can stop saying no. Yes! You can stop saying yes. No! You're beginning to irritate me. I'm going to rub you out. No! I am going to rub you out. No! I'm going to rub you out. There we go. <laughs> and that, sadly, is the picture no more. Hmm, now I have something of a knotty problem. Let me explain. I have here a large red silk handkerchief. Now, if I was to take this handkerchief and if I was to tie a knot, it, like this, I would have a knot, where previously there was not a knot. Now not having a knot is not like having a knot, because if you do not have a knot, then you do not have a knot where the knot is. But I do have a knot where the knot is, which means I do not not have a knot. Now if I do not want the knot where the knot is, all I have to do is a little magical blow, and I may move the knot so that the knot is not where the knot was, but the knot is where the knot is. If I still do not like where the knot is, oh, I do not like where the knot was, not was, not is, but not before, I can move the knot again. Now, you may not know how I can move the knot, because knots do not move, but this knot may come all the way off, so that there is not a knot. Let me demonstrate again. We take the red silk handkerchief. We tie a knot. 
so that we now have a knot where previously there was not a knot. Once more, the knot is not where the knot wasn't, but the knot is where the knot is. If the knot is not where the knot was, the knot can be moved to where the knot is. The knot may not be moved because knots do not move. This knot, with a magical blow, may not come all the way off to the end. Once more. Now to prove that there are not knots where the knot was not, all we have to do is unfold the handkerchief and we can see that there is not a knot. I've had a really fun time of it showing you some strange magic. Thank you so much for joining me. So, this is the Leicester St George's Festival. I am Professor Strange, and with one final wish of the magic wand, I wish you goodbye. I'm back. What? Oh, oh the hat. <laughs> Thanks. Hello, I'm Alan Kempthorne, here today as St George. You are watching the Leicester St George's Festival, here on your computer screen. Or maybe you're watching it on a phone, or an iPad. Or maybe you're watching it over the shoulder of somebody else. That's, that's just irritating. Why would you do that? Why? Now, every year in Orton Square, in Leicester's Old Quarter, we bring you all this wonderful goodness that you've been watching today. And every year we have arts and crafts from these guys. Let's welcome again, Giggle Town Arts. So now we're going to make a concertina dancing dragon puppet, which is quite a mouthful. So you need to download the sheet, then cut out the pieces. So you cut out two long rectangles. The feet, the tail, the arms, and the head. So let's do the rectangles first, because they're nice and easy. There. Make sure the, the lines are nice and straight. So what you're going to do is cut two rectangles, and you see where the squares are. We're going to fold that concertina style. I can get the scissors in there. Let's so follow the instructions on the card, line up both pieces of card like so, so the writing overlaps, then you fold one over, then the next one over, then the first one, and the second one, and then keep going until you reach the end. And then if you carefully pull it out, you should have that effect. So glue the two ends together, so we'll glue there. and then glue the other side. Give it a good press, nice and tight. So that will be the body of the dragon. Now you need to cut out the feet, the tail, and the head. So we go round. So the dragon's got nice pointy claws. Put your sticky glue on, 
and you want to stick feet at the front and the back. So there's the feet. Just bend them forward slightly. Then you need the feet for the back. Cut around the claws. Nearly done. Pop the glue on and then put the feet on the back and just slightly bend the feet forward so it looks like they've got some movement. Like so. Then you need to cut out the tail. So the dragon's got a nice pointy tail. Then glue the tail onto the back of the dragon. Like so. And now all you need to do is cut out the dragon's head and stick on the dragon's head. So we use this one I made earlier. Put lots of glue on. And then stick the dragon's head onto the front. And there you have your concertina dragon puppet. So thank you for joining us uh, this year for St George's Virtual Festival. Uh, we hope you enjoyed yourself and enjoy the rest of the programme. <laughs> Don't worry, it's, uh, it's only a picture. <sighs> you are watching the Leicester St George's Festival with me, St George. <laughs> Obviously. Now, Every year at our festival in Orton Square, we're joined by those lovely people at Leicester Libraries who park their special library book bus right in the middle of Orton Square. And they never get a parking ticket. What's that about? What? Oh, <laughs> apparently they're, they're allowed to be there. So that's all right then. So let's go over to Leicester Libraries and we're going to meet Matthew Vaughan, who's going to be reading us the story, Stone Soup. Afternoon. I'm Matt from Leicester Libraries and they've asked me to come here today to tell you a story. And the story I've got for you is an old one. It's called Stone Soup. Back in the time of St George, there were no newspapers. And if there had been, most people wouldn't have been able to read them. And even if they could have read them, there wouldn't have been any stories of St George in them. Not in England at that time anyway. Because he was born in Turkey, and when he killed that dragon he was most famous for, he was in um, Libya, I think. But anyway, in old England, news had to travel by word of mouth. It travelled with wagoners and traders of all sorts. Travelled with sellers of relics and sellers of medicine. I say medicine, they weren't doctors, and you wouldn't have wanted to drink their potion if you knew what was in it. But anyway, the best news of all came with the storyteller. And when times were good, the storyteller would be welcomed with open arms. But sometimes, times were hard and it could be difficult for the travelling storyteller to get a bite to eat. It was on a summer's day in the reign of King Richard, the one that some people call Lion Art when the storyteller came over the hill and down the valley into the village. He came to the first house and he knocked on the door 
And a woman answered, little girl clinging and peeping out from behind her skirts. A bite to eat for the storyteller, madam, and I will tell you a tale of wonder. Oh, and it's no fear we've got no time for stories here. We can barely feed ourselves, she said. And she shut the door. Well, Lily, the little girl, she would have loved a story. So no sooner had the door closed than she crept out and round the house and followed on behind the storyteller as he carried on down the street till he came to the blacksmith's shop. And he followed the sound of hammering and the steam rising from the forge. And when he showed his face round the shop door, the hammering stopped. And a big man with thick arms folded his arms across the chest. Bite to eat for the storyteller, sir, and I will tell you a tale of wonders. Huh, us is working folk. We got no time for stories here. Well, the little lad, Peter, sat in the corner. He would have loved a story. And no sooner had the shop door shut than he snuck out, down, following the street after the storyteller. And so he went on, from house to house to house. The grown-ups were poor. They got no food. They got no time for stories. But the kids, they followed on, out of their houses, in ones, in twos, in threes, until, by the time the storyteller came to the village green, it was quite a following he had. Well, as he was gathering sticks through his fire, he could be heard to mutter. <sighs> Looks like it's stone soup for me again today. And he built his fire, and he filled his billy can from the stream, and he put it on the fire to boil. And then he began to pace, looking at the ground as he went, as if seeking for something valuable. And this is what the children heard. No, this one's too big. This one's too small. Ah, that one's too knobbly, it won't do at all. And that one's too dark and this one's too light, but ah, this one, this one just here, this one's just right. And when he stood up, on the palm of his hand was a smooth, round stone. Well, to the children, it looked just like a hundred other stones. So they were amazed when he walked over and with a plop, he dropped it into his pan. And he sat down and he withdrew a spoon from his cloak and he began to stir. And he began to sniff. And after a while, he tasted. Mmm, stone soup. Delicious, he said. But, you know what this soup needs to make it perfect? Just, just a pinch of salt. Well, no sooner had Lily heard that than she was off home and she came back with a pinch of salt in the palm of her hand. She gave it shyly to the storyteller and into the pan it went. And he sat and he stirred and he tasted. Mmm, stone soup. Delicious. But you know, just one small onion would make this perfect. Well, Peter was off and he was back with an onion and into the pan it went. And so it went on. He stirred and he tasted and he named vegetables. Rosemary and carrots and one vegetable after another until he'd named every vegetable you ever heard of. And the kids were running to and fro, fetching bits and bobs from home. And soon the air was filled with, with this delicious aromatic smell. And he stirred one more time and he tasted and he took his billy can off the fire and he began to eat. Well that smell filled the air and one by one, the adults were drawn down from their houses to the village green to join their children in a circle all around the storyteller while he ate. 
and he ate and he ate until that billy can was clean and then he stood up and he stretched oh, and he sighed and he burped and he bowed well he said i have had my bite to eat and you have all had your story what story said peter and lily together ha <laughs> ha said the storyteller stone soup but you know that wasn't the only story he told that night and even the adults they forgot their work and their hardship for a little while because well that is the power of stories thank you very much yeah yeah you liked that didn't you boy yeah right so you are watching the leicester st george's festival here could you stop that please you are watching the leicester st george's festival here on like i said stop that i'm trying to do a bit to camera okay thank you <clears throat> you are watching stop it this is the Leicester St. All right, all right, all right. I'm good. Okay, good. Are we good? Good? Okay, good. This is the Leicester St. George's Festival. I'm Alan Kempthorne as your host, St. George. Now, still to come, we've a virtual guided walk along the route of the old medieval walls of Leicester City with local historian Jim Butler. We also have a scrumifying medieval cookery demonstration. Yeah, yeah, I know. I'm excited about that one too. Yeah. <laughs> and the amazing folk band Luma will be here to round things off at the end of the day. But first, let's stop it. But first, I said stop it. Let's rejoin our old pal, Sylvester the Jester. Stop, 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 stop! <laughs> Sylvester the Jester and it's time for another extremely bad joke where would you find Spider-Man on his website and why don't cannibals eat clowns because they taste funny now my jokes do get worse and worse and worse so I think that's enough jokes for the time being now I mentioned earlier on that I am the official jester to the city of Leicester I'm going to tell you how that came about um, a few years back, I invited another seven jesters to come and visit Leicester and we, we, we travelled around the city centre in a horse-drawn bus and until eventually we arrived at the Guild Hall, which is where we are today. And uh, the Lord Mayor of Leicester uh, threw a glass of water in my face and declared that I was the official jester to the city of Leicester. And uh, I have been ever since that day. And uh, I'm going to sing you a song now. Does, does anybody know that song? Old MacDonald had a, uh, oh dear, uh, fish and chip shop. Is that right? No. Oh dear, oh dear, I know. Old MacDonald had a pickled onion factory. That must be right. No. It's not, oh dear, dear. Um, I know. Old MacDonald had a car park. No. no. Oh dear, dear. Uh, old MacDonald had a banana. No. no. Oh dear. Well, what did he have? A farm. Oh, brilliant. That's good. I because I know I know what the animals uh, are and I know what noises they make. So, so do sing along. Now I'm MacDonald had a farm, E-I-E-I-O, and on that farm he had some pigs, E-I-E-I-O. Now I know what the pigs do. They go woof woof. No. 
Oh dear. Uh, well, well, where did the pigs go? Oi, oi. Are you sure? Yeah. Uh, well, right. We are a wink, wink, here and a wink, wink, there. Here a wink, there a wink, everywhere a wink, wink. Old MacDonald had a farm. E-I-E-I-O. Now old MacDonald had a farm. E-I-E-I-O. And old MacDonald had some ducks. Now I know what the ducks do. They go, nay, nay. No. no! Don't! Oh dear, dear. Uh, well, well, uh, what, 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 what did the ducks go? Quack, quack! quack. Are you sure? Yeah! Oh, all right. We're a quack, quack, here and a quack, quack, there. Here a quack, there a quack, everywhere a quack, quack, a wink, wink, here, wink, wink, there. Here a wink, there a wink, everywhere a wink. Cows, they go cluck cluck. No, they don't. Oh no. dear. Yeah. Uh, where, where, where did they go? Moo. Sure. Yeah. We are moo moo here and moo moo there. Here a moo, there a moo, everywhere a moo moo. Quack quack here, quack quack there. Here a quack, there a quack, everywhere a quack quack. A wink wink here and a wink wink there. Here a wink, there a wink. Know what the sheep do? They go meow meow. Well, no. oh dear, dear, dear. They, they, they don't. No. You, are you sure? Yeah. Uh, well, what do they go? The sheep. Ba. With a ba ba here, ba ba there, here a ba there a ba, everywhere a ba ba, moo moo here and a moo moo there, here a moo there a moo, everywhere a moo moo, quack quack here, quack quack there, here a quack there a quack, everywhere a quack. Wink, 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 here, wink, wink, there, here, wink, there, wink, everywhere, wink, wink, oh, man. Well, that's about it from me. <clears throat> so I'll see you hopefully next year at uh, the St. George's Festival. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you Sylvester the Jester and hopefully we'll be seeing him again in person when we all return to our usual home in Leicester's Orton Square for next year's Leicester St George's Festival. Coming up soon we've got a medieval cookery demonstration. Oof, I can't wait for that one. But first it's history time. Now you know that Leicester's a pretty ancient city, right? But have you ever wondered what life was like in Leicester in maybe the old Roman or medieval times? Well, the guy who knows all about that is Jim Butler, who spent his time in lockdown filming a whole series of videos exploring the hidden histories of Leicester. He's called it Hidden Histories of Leicester. <laughs> Figures. And Jim knows his stuff too. He's the Honorary Secretary of the Leicestershire Archaeological and Historical Society. So, here is Jim Butler to guide you around the first of his virtual tours, looking at the root of Leicester's original Roman and medieval walls. Welcome to Hidden Histories of Leicester, a series of videos exploring over 2,000 years of the not so visible history and heritage of the city, suburbs and wider county. My name is Jim Butler and for as long as I can remember I've been fascinated by the history of this my hometown and so I've gathered a range of historical and contemporary sources as well as the latest archaeological reports to build these virtual tours and give you an insight into our hidden heritage. My hope is that after each video, you will see some very familiar sites with a slightly different perspective. If you like and enjoy these videos, then please do remember to like the channel, leave any comments and subscribe.
Thank you. In this first video, we're going to get a sense of the old town by walking the route of the Roman and medieval defensive walls. Unlike York and Chester, where you can literally circumnavigate the town by walking the walls, much of Leicester's medieval defences are long gone. But that doesn't mean we can't still follow the route and identify some of the clues pointing to its former existence. Perhaps the most recognisable element of the town walls is the turret gateway here in Castle View. This gateway was built in 1422 to connect the inner bailey of the castle to the Newark precinct, both of which we'll explore in later videos. Prior to the gateway, there is likely to have been some form of defensive barrier here, be it a ditch, wooden palisade or stone wall since pre-Roman times. The wall dividing the gardens of Newark Houses Museum and St Mary de Castro Churchyard is all that remains of Leicester's once formidable defences. For now, we'll head east along the town's southern wall. Here we stand at Southgate, the Roman and medieval southern entrance into the town. The Romans invaded Britain in 43 AD and by 47 AD had found their way to the capital settlement of a Celtic tribe they called the Coriel Tavori. The Romans renamed the town Ratai Coriel Tavorum and Ratai is thought to refer to the Britonic word for ramparts, suggesting the site was fortified before the Romans invaded. Shortly after arriving, the Romans dig a ditch and build a wooden palisade as evidenced by post holes excavated due west. However, in the late second century, the palisade is replaced with a substantial stone wall and two outer ditches, about three metres deep. From the south comes the Roman Tripontium Road. Tripontium was a settlement on Watling Street on the present Leicestershire Warwickshire border. It is about three miles south of Lutterworth. From the southeast came a road that connected to the Via Divana, the road that led from the Roman capital Colchester, through Cambridgeshire and across Leicester before heading northwest to Chester. In medieval times, this road was known as Hangman's Lane. That may be because the route heads southeast towards the top of London Road, where the gallows were situated. To the north, in Roman times, the road led in a straight line following the route of the underpass to the southwest corner of the Forum. In medieval times, the road now veers to the east up to High Cross and is aptly named High Cross Street. The southern gateway itself has not survived but both the Roman and medieval walls had ramparts and it's likely that within one of these, or between two, that an easily defendable gateway could have been placed. Let's move on a little. To the east, the wall continues running between Friar Lane on the left and Millstone Lane on the right. As I'll be doing separate videos on the medieval town, we're going to walk the outside of the walls and follow the path of the town's former defensive ditches. To illustrate that we're now outside of the Roman walls, between the back of Millstone Lane and Newark Street, a 4th century Roman cemetery was discovered, with at least 30 people buried there. The Romans famously always buried their dead outside of town. It's worth remembering that through the Roman and medieval period, the town wall was continuous, so no cutting through to your favourite shops or taverns. By all accounts, pretty much everything this side of the wall, i.e. outside of it, was open fields. A quick note on ditches. In Leicester's case, we are classing a ditch as a relatively steeply angled trench or trenches around the outside of the town wall to encumber and slow down attacking forces. There is no evidence that I'm aware of to suggest that Leicester's defences were moated or that the ditches were filled with water supplied by the river, which is quite some way downhill now. No doubt, after floods and periods of heavy rain, there would be areas where the water would gather and, along with any rotting rubbish that would be thrown in them, would make quite a stink, but no moat. Here we find ourselves at the southeast corner of the Roman and medieval town. From south gates, the wall comes through the line of this building here and then heads off through the middle of the tourist information centre here. 
To give you a sense of its size, from the archaeological evidence, the wall was 3.5 metres wide at the base, 5 metres high, which is about the size of that sign, and had 1.5 metre deep foundations. From here, we head north. Here at the Angel Gateway is another great spot to understand the town wall. In 1979, a filled ditch was found here running parallel to Cheapside. Further investigation led to the conclusion that what had been discovered was not the town ditch, but rather a rubber trench of the town wall. For those unfamiliar with rubber trenches, they are where the stones that formed a wall or building foundation were removed by someone in the past to use for their own building. Once they've taken the stone, the rubber refills the resulting hole or trench with whatever soil and rubbish they can find. The subsequent rubber trench is only discernible because the soil from the two different dates will be slightly different in colour. Hopefully, any pottery or non-degradable deposits found in the trench can give an indication of when the stone was robbed and it was backfilled. Sadly, no such evidence was recorded at this spot. But from here, we can clearly see how the wall, even after it has gone, still forms a key delineation between the premises inside the town and those outside of it, each of which at some point would have abutted up to the wall. For many, the clock tower is regarded as the centre of Leicester. The iconic monument has stood close to the site of the old Haymarket for over 150 years, but as you can clearly see, it stands well outside the footprint of the Roman and medieval town. Here at East Gates in Roman times, the key gateway cut across the town to the gateway at West Bridge, following the line of the present Silver Street. From the gateway, the road becomes the major Roman artery, the Fossway, heading out up Belgrave Gate in pretty much a straight line all the way to Lincoln. In the medieval era, the road leads onto what was called Swine Market, which leads all the way up to the present High Street and to the site of the original High Cross. At the approximate entrance to the High Cross shopping centre, you would have entered Parchment Lane, but more on that another day. This is perhaps a good point to discuss gates and gatters. If you are familiar with Leicester, you will know that there are a number of streets in the city that have the suffix gate, for example, Northgate, Woodgate, Braunston Gate, etc. However, only three of these surviving street names actually refer to physical gateways in the town walls, and these are named after the points of the compass, so South Gates, East Gates and North Gate. The other gates are actually names derived from the Old Norse term gatter, which means way to or street, and can be found in many towns that were part of Alfred the Great's Danelaw. So in these instances, gate refers to way to, hence Gallow Tree Gate leads the way to the former gallows at the top of what is now London Road. Humberston Gate leads all the way to Humberston, likewise with Belgrave Gate and with Church Gate. In this case, the church we're talking about is St Margaret's Church to the north of the town, which is the way we go now. Just a quick detour to note another handy use for a medieval town wall. For a moment, we step through the walls onto Buckclose Lane. In the 14th and 15th centuries, there was a push to train boys and men from age 14 upwards in a proficient use of the longbow. This was so that they could be called upon to serve as archers in a hundred years war against France. In every town and village across England, areas were allocated for enforced weekly target practice. The targets, called butts, would be set up somewhere relatively safe so that stray arrows would not cause damage or injury. In Leicester, they decided where better than against the town wall right here. So every Sunday, Leicester's young men would make their way to Buckclose Lane for their mandatory two hours of practice, take aim and shoot. At the northeast corner of the walls lies St Margaret's Church, the only one of the city's five ancient churches to be built outside of the town walls. There's been a church on the site since at least 1086, and one of the theories as to why it's outside of the walls is that it was originally built by a community of early Danish settlers who'd wanted to live close enough to the town to trade with its occupants, but not actually live in the town. When these settlers were converted to Christianity, they needed a church, and so St Margaret's was built. The nearest buildings of interest from here in the medieval era was St Mary's Abbey across the river. Of course, there was no road to take you across there as there is today. Instead, if you wished to visit the abbey, you had to take a more circuitous route, which we'll talk about a little later. 
It's worth taking a moment to talk about Sambigate, as I often hear questions relating to its name. It's thought that during the Danish occupation of the town during the late 9th and early 10th century, there was a race course along here that went across into Abbey Meadows that was called the Skate. In the medieval era, this street took on a completely different role, as it became the site for the annual Whit Sunday religious procession. A delegation from St Mary de Castro Church would meet with another delegation from St Martin's Church, which is now the cathedral, probably somewhere near North Gates, and they would carry an effigy of the Virgin Mary and lead a procession down all the way to St Margaret's Church. The annual procession earned the street the name the Holy Way, or in Latin, Sancta Via, which over the centuries has been corrupted into Sanvi. Here at Northgates, we're at the opposite end of town from where we first started. Although there was a gateway here in the Roman period and a road leading north, there is speculation as to where that road ultimately led. In the medieval era, Northgates was connected directly to Southgate via High Cross Street, and if you were to leave the town heading due north, you would pass through a suburb of shops and buildings before crossing the river at the North Bridge. This is not to be confused with the bridge over the present canal, which obviously didn't exist. Over the bridge, the road forked, and to the right was Abbey Gate, which led to the Abbey of St Mary's, and then further on north to Nottingham via the line of the A6. This was the route that Richard III took on his way into Leicester before the Battle of Bosworth. If you turned left at the fork, you would go down Woodgate, which was the route to the Royal Hunting Grounds of Leicester Forest. From Northgates, the wall continues to run parallel to and just south of Saw Lane. From this vantage point, and thanks to the construction going on behind me, we can now get an idea of the extent of the northwest corner of the medieval and Roman town. Interestingly, it appears that the earlier Roman town actually extended further north than it did at later times. Archaeologists have recently discovered a high status Roman building just north of Saw Lane that appears to have been abandoned in the second century AD to make way for the new Roman defences. Likewise, a second Roman boundary wall was discovered behind me, pushed over in its entirety, again to make way for these new larger defensive walls. I'm back inside the western wall of the medieval and Roman town. The other side of the wall is the river. What we do know from existing archaeological reports is that this was a busy part of town in both Roman and medieval periods, with high status Roman buildings, mosaics and jewellery found in the area. There was also evidence for the Dominican Blackfriars Friary and occupations such as tanning found here. All of these I will cover in a later video. The walls here, though, do give us insight into one of England's lesser-known rebellions. The revolt of 1173-74 to was a rebellion against King Henry II by three of his sons. Henry, the eldest son, along with his brother Richard, who would become Richard the Lionheart, and another brother, Geoffrey, turned on the king and the youngest brother, John. Yes, that John of Robin Hood and Magna Carta fame. Henry the Younger's friend, Robert de Beaumont, Earl of Leicester, supported the rebellion and provided Henry with troops. King Henry's forces took Leicester Castle in retaliation. Archaeologists discovered heavily scorched stones in this area and have suggested that they could be the result of an attempt by King Henry's forces to sap or undermine the walled defences as part of that attack. Perhaps the most known gateway into the Roman and medieval Leicester stood here beside Westbridge. It was here that the Romans discovered a natural ford that enabled them to cross the river into the Iron Age settlement and set up camp. It was the entrance to the town for the major Roman road, the Foss Way, as it made its way from Exeter. 
as well as the lesser Mansetter Road that headed west towards Glenfield before veering southwest to join Watling Street at the Mansetter settlement. It was also here that Richard III left the town on his way to Bosworth, only to return a few days later, dead and naked, flung across the back of a horse. Although there is no longer any reminder or remnant of the West Gate, it has always been and remains to this day one of the most important gateways into the city centre. The final stop on this tour of the town walls is at the castle walls here in Castle Gardens. These remains date from the 12th or 13th centuries and two oak stakes were also found nearby which are thought to have been associated with a drawbridge, linking the medieval castle bailey with the rest of town. Through the 15th and 16th centuries, Leicester's defensive walls gradually fell into disrepair. With little perceived need for their upkeep, they either fell into decay or were dismantled by individuals wishing to use the stone for their own means. Attempts were made to re make repairs to the wall before the town was besieged in 1645 by the King's men during the Civil War. The town came under heavy fire, especially around the Newark, but the wall was eventually breached at the East Gates and the town was sacked. After the Civil War, the walls were never repaired and from this time onwards they gradually decayed and disappeared. However, their presence endures to this day, through the street patterns they influenced and the street names that still bear witness to them. The fascinating story of Leicester's defensive walls tell us not just about the history of this city, but they also reflect the wider political and social events happened across the country over the past 2,000 years. No, this city does not have the same overt heritage as places like York or Bath or Canterbury, but it doesn't mean that the history isn't there. Leicester's history is hidden, but in my opinion, that just makes it more exciting to discover. I hope you've enjoyed this little tour. If so, please like, subscribe and share. Thanks for watching. I'm St George and this is the Leicester St George's Festival or at least it has been because I've got to say we are drawing towards the end of our entertainment for you guys today. Sorry, kind of had to happen at some point. I hope you've enjoyed all the fun and remember we are usually live in Orton Square in Leicester on the Saturday nearest to St George's Day every year without fail except last year because that was 2020 and nothing happened anywhere anywhere which is why this year we're delighted that we've been able to bring you the st george's festival here on your computer screen so thank you so much for staying with us today and i hope that you've really enjoyed it and had a lot of fun now as you know if you've ever joined us live at the Auden square festival uh we always like to end with some foot stomping folk or acoustic music and this year is no exception so this is Luma. These are two tunes from the northwest of England. The first one is called Rusty Gully, and the second one is called The Dusty Miller. And they're preceded uh, by a waltz, which is an arrangement of Rusty Gully written by Liz.
these are two tunes, English tunes, um, written by Fred Pigeon. Fred Pigeon's number one and number two. This is a song called Lowlands of Holland and tells the story um, about somebody who was press ganged to go and sail on Her Majesty's Navy.
These next two tunes are perhaps the most um, familiar and popular tunes out. Uh, one that played all over the place. The first one is called Morpeth Rant, and the second one is an arrangement of a very popular tune called Soldier's Joy.
And so there we have it. Uh, we're going to draw an end to the Leicester St George's Festival for 2021. So a big thank you from myself and from my friend here, the uh, little baby dragon spot, to absolutely everyone who helped out making this year's festival work right here on your computer screen. Wow! Well, we dearly hope that we'll be back in the flesh next year for the Leicester St George's Festival 2022. So until then, stay safe. Stay sane. Always keep a sword's length away from other people. Wear your mask where you have to. And always wash your hands after slaying a dragon. No, not you, not you. That's quite all right. Don't you worry. <laughs> so look, uh, we're going to leave you with a clip of some of the previous year's St George's festivals. And uh, we will see you in Orton Square, April 2022. See you then. Thank you so much for joining us. Bye bye. Shall we go get something to eat? Yeah. Yeah, you promise you won't burn it this time. Okay.